Revelation U, God, and KJV Bible Dash. Chapter 6 to 9. Chapter 6. Chapter 6 is the opening up of the first six seals of God's judgment against man. These seals are a summary of the entire seven year tribulation period. The first four seals correspond to Matthew 24 verses 4 to 8, which are called the beginning of sorrows. These take place during the first three half a years of the tribulation period. Then, the last three and a half years of the tribulation period take place, which Jesus calls Great Tribulation, Matthew 24 verse 21. God's judgment in Great Tribulation is summarized in seals 5 to 7. The seventh seal is opened in 8, colon 1. The seven trumpet judgments, chapters 8 to 11, and the seven vile judgments, chapter 16. Several events happen in the middle of the tribulation period, the most significant of which is the abomination of desolation, Matthew 24 verse 15, being set up by the Antichrist in the temple. This is the image of the beast that all must worship or be put to death, 1315. Thus, the fifth seal shows all the saints killed during the Great Tribulation, Matthew 24 verse 21. The sixth seal shows God's judgment of the unbelievers at His second coming. Six colon one thunder represents the voice of God, 2 Samuel 22 verse 14 and John 12 verses 28 to 29. Therefore, God speaks to Israel to repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 3 verse 2, through the thunder of the tribulation period. 6 colon 2 The first seal is of someone with a bow, sitting on a white horse. This is not the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ comes on a white horse after the tribulation. Period is over, and he has a sharp sword, which is the word of God, coming out of his mouth, 19 colon 15 dash 16. He does not have a bow. Since the first seal is the beginning of the tribulation period and Satan rules during the tribulation period, the one on the white horse is Satan. It makes sense that Satan would have a similar entrance as the Lord Jesus Christ will have, because Satan is the great imitator of God. He will deceive many into thinking that he is God and that the Antichrist is the Christ. That is what Matthew 24 verses 4 to 5 says. Satan has a bow, here, depicting him as an archer. The symbol of an archer is two fingers raised, as if to use the bow. It is no coincidence that pictures of Satan, drawn by Satan worshippers throughout history, show Satan with two fingers raised. It is also no coincidence that the Pope of the Catholic Church raises two fingers and blesses people in like manner as an archer handles his bow. This shows the Pope as the head of Satan's church. It is called Catholic today. It is known by God as Babylon 17, 5, which means confusion, Genesis 11 verse 9. So, this first judgment rendered upon man during the tribulation period is that Satan is given a crown to be temporary king of the world. Note that the crown was given unto him, 6, 2. A crown was never handed to Jesus Christ unless you count his crown of thorns, Matthew 27, 29. Jesus earned his crowns through his perfect life, death, burial, and resurrection. He also does not just have one crown, but on his head were many crowns, 1912. Jesus is not just a king, but he is king of kings and lord of lords, 1916. Also, at his second coming, Jesus has the armies which were in heaven following him, 1914. There are no such armies mentioned here for Satan. Thus, the one on the white horse in 6, 2 is none other than Satan himself. God gives Satan the power to be king of the world for seven years. Most of the world will follow him, but the result will be that Israel will be saved so they can be a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles when Jesus reigns over the earth. Also, note from 6, 1, the command to come and see. Israel should not take people's word that Satan is God. Rather, they should come and see 
by comparing what is going on with the scriptures to see for themselves that Satan is an imposter. 6, 3. In the case of the first, for seals, the first thing Israel is told is to come and see. The first three and a half years of the tribulation period is Israel's opportunity to come and see what is going on. If they use the spiritual eyes of belief to see, they will note that Israel is being tried because of their unbelief and believe the gospel of the kingdom, as proclaimed by the two witnesses, 11, 1-6, and the little flock of Israel. They will then be given the Holy Ghost so that they can endure unto the end of the tribulation period and be saved. Matthew 24 verse 13. If they do not come and see this during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, they will end up bowing down to the image or taking the mark of the beast during the last three and a half years of the tribulation period, resulting in them being tormented forever in the lake of fire. 14, 9-11. Since the first four seals cover the trials of the first half of the tribulation period, all four of these seals, and no other place in Revelation, contain the invitation for Israel to come and see, 6, 1, 3, 5, 7. In John 1 verse 38, two disciples of John the Baptist called Jesus Rabbi. Jesus told them to come and see, John 1 verse 39. The result of them coming and seeing was that we have found the Messiahs, which is, being interpreted, the Christ, John 1 verse 41. They went from thinking of Jesus as a teacher to recognizing him as their Messiah because they came and saw. Similarly, during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, a remnant of Israel will come and see that Jesus is their Messiah, as opposed to the Antichrist being their Messiah, and they will have faith in God to bring them into the kingdom, instead of bowing down to the image of the beast. 6, 4, the one, sitting on the red horse, would be a devil underneath Satan. The horse is red because of the bloodshed he causes. He takes peace from the earth, and people kill each other. These are the wars and rumors of wars, and the nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom, as Jesus said in Matthew 24, 6-7a. The ultimate world war will be going on, but the end is not yet. Matthew 24 verse 6. This is only the beginning of sorrows. Matthew 24 verse 8. Note that there was given unto him a great sword. 6 colon 4. Contrast this with the Lord Jesus Christ, who out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. 1915. The Lord has the sharp sword because it is the word of God. The one on the red horse has a great sword given unto him. Perhaps this sword is the great things and blasphemies that also come out of the mouth of the Antichrist, 13, colon 5. 6, colon 5 dash 6 the one on the third horse, like the one on the second horse, would be a devil, high in Satan's ranks. 656 show that Satan will now control the food supply, as indicated by the pair of balances in his hand, 6, colon 5. In this trial, though, he makes food very plenteous. Wheat and barley are cheap, and there is plenty of oil and wine. So, in the first seal, Satan swoops in and starts conquering territories. In the second seal, he creates wars and chaos. In that situation, then, the world will look for a savior, someone to help them out of their predicament. That someone is the one in the third seal, bringing prosperous economic times to the world. This person, then, is the Antichrist. You can see, then, how Satan manipulates human evil and good together to get the world to follow him. Note that the Antichrist rides upon a black horse. We often think of black as the color of death. Black, though, represents spiritual darkness. Spiritual darkness is brought by the Antichrist in the third seal by bringing economic prosperity. Remember Lot. He chose economic prosperity, and Sodom and Gomorrah got so wicked that God destroyed them with fire. Similarly, the world will follow after the economic prosperity that the Antichrist brings, 
going into spiritual darkness and being destroyed by God with fire at the end of the tribulation period, as a result. 6, 7-8, people talk about the Grim Reaper. Well, here he is. He sits on a pale horse, indicating death. So, black is not the color of death after all. Again, Satan uses one of his devils as a force of evil to make people run to the Antichrist as their savior. In this fourth seal, it is a tag team effort with two devils. The first one brings death, and the second one brings them to hell. 2014 says that, at the great white throne judgment, death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. As will be seen in the fifth seal, 6, 9-11. When believers are killed, they go to heaven, not hell, and wait for the redemption of their bodies at Jesus' second coming. Therefore, the 25% of the people who death and hell kill here must be unbelievers. Otherwise, death and hell would have no power over them. These unbelievers dying are a sign to Israel of how the Lord Jesus Christ will come at the end of the tribulation period and tread the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, 1915, disposing of those aligned with the Antichrist. Thus, Israel needs to come and see, 6, 7, what death and hell do to 25% of the earth so that Israel believes God's law covenant with them so that they will not be part of those destroyed at Jesus' second coming. Death and hell will kill by having people kill each other, having people literally starve to death, killing them with diseases, and having animals kill them, 6, 8. This fourth seal coincides with the famines, pestilences, and earthquakes mentioned by Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 7. Also, note how famine is brought about just after people had plenty to eat in the third seal. This shows how Satan plays with the emotions of people to get them to make decisions based upon their material circumstances, rather than their spiritual. This kind of devilish wisdom is sensual or based upon their senses, James 3 verse 15. Satan is just setting the world up for taking the mark of the beast. When he gives everyone plenty of food, they follow him. When he takes the food away, he blames someone else. Then, he institutes the mark of the beast for the last half of the tribulation period, and the world will take the mark to ensure that they have plenty of food in the future, thereby sealing their doom in an eternal lake of fire. 6, 9 Although not seen here, there is a major change in the world between seals 4 and 5. We see this change in Matthew 24. Jesus says that the first, first seals are the beginning of sorrows, Matthew 24 verse 8. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. Matthew 24, colon 9. The reason for this change is that the first half of the tribulation period ends with the completion of the fourth seal. In the first half of the tribulation period, there are seven kings in the world, and the Antichrist is one of the seven kings, ruling over the Middle East, 17, 10-11. The two witnesses keep him from sitting in the temple and declaring himself to be God, so, he attempts to kill them, and they kill him instead, 11, 5, 13, 3. Then, Satan resurrects the Antichrist as a beast, and he kills the two witnesses, 13, 1-2. 11, 7. The world hates the two witnesses, 11, 8 10, and so the world now sees the Antichrist as their Messiah, especially since he rose from the dead, which makes them think that he has the power over death, 13, 4 7. Now, he can finally sit in the temple and declare himself to be God, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. The world now has 10 kings. But all ten kings give their power to the Antichrist, since they see him as God, 17, 12 13. Thus, the Antichrist is the world's ruler during the last half of the tribulation period, 13, 5. With this power over the world, the Antichrist is able to control everything. Thus, an image of the beast is made, and all who will not worship it are to be killed, 
13,14-15. However, God has declared that all, who bow down to the image of the beast, are to spend eternity in the lake of fire, 14,9-11. Thus, believers will not bow down to the image of the beast, which results in the Antichrist and apostate Israel trying to hunt them down to kill them. This is why the last half of the tribulation period is called Great Tribulation, Matthew 24 verse 21, and Jesus tells the little flock to run for their lives, Matthew 24 verses 15 to 20. Therefore, the fifth seal shows those killed during the Great Tribulation for the Word of God and for the testimony which they held, 6, 9. They would not bow down to the image, because they professed Jesus to be the true Christ. Therefore, the Antichrist had them killed. Note that the greatest opportunity for Israel to repent and put themselves back under God's law covenant with them so that they may have eternal life in God's kingdom on earth is during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. If they wait until Great Tribulation, they will probably end up continuing to follow the lies of the Antichrist and apostate Israel, since their physical lives will be at stake. They will take the make of the beast so they can eat, 1317, thus, giving up their birthright into the kingdom, just like Esau did, for food, Hebrews 12 verses 16 to 17. This is why the instruction to come and see, that we see in each of the first, for seals, 6, colon 1, 3, 5, and 7, is not given for the last, three seals. Israel should have already seen enough in the first half of the tribulation period to make the decision to place their faith in God and His Word, rather than in Satan, anti-God, His Christ, Antichrist, the false prophet, anti-Holy Ghost, and apostate Israel, anti-Israel. 610 Those martyred, for not bowing down to the image of the beast, want to know how long the Lord will not judge those killing believers on earth. This is the question of all faithful believers throughout history, as they see Satan ruling over the earth and the heaven, instead of God. 6 9-10 also teaches us that, when believers die, their souls go to heaven, where they wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to give them glorified bodies. Paul says that we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven, that mortality might be swallowed up of life, 2 Corinthians 5 verses 2 and 4. Therefore, in addition to wanting God to take vengeance upon unbelievers, those souls under the altar in the fifth seal also wonder how long they will have to wait before they receive their glorified bodies. 611 First White robes are given to the martyred saints in heaven. These white robes, according to 19, 8, are the righteousness of saints. Therefore, the first thing God does is grant them righteousness. In other words, God is more concerned with their salvation than he is with the destruction of the wicked. It is only after they are clothed with God's righteousness that he answers their question. The answer is that, in order to make sure that all of Israel is saved, Romans 11 verse 26, more believers will have to be killed. In John 17 verse 12, Jesus said that he made sure that none of those given to him by the Father were lost. Similarly, in the tribulation period, Jesus will make sure that all of the lost sheep of the house of Israel are found. This means that many of the found sheep will have to be killed by Satan before the remaining lost sheep realize the danger of apostate Israel and the Antichrist and flee to the Good Shepherd, John 10 verse 14, to bring them into his fold. This will take a little season, 611, to accomplish, which is the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. We learn two things from this. First, we see the extremes to which wickedness must go before people will abandon their foolish pride and finally trust in God to save them. Second, we learn that God is concerned with people's eternal souls over their physical lives. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10 verse 28. Dot. So many people today think that God wants them to be healthy and live long lives. 
We learn from this verse that God is only concerned with where they spend eternity and is willing to have them unjustly killed if it means that more people will be saved as a result. Somehow, this message is lost among our megachurches today. 6, 12-13, the events in Revelation are not always presented in chronological order. The sixth seal happens after the entire seven-year tribulation period is over. The way we know this is that Matthew 24 verse 29 tells us that the events of the sixth seal take place immediately after the tribulation of those days. Therefore, the first, first seals are of the first three and a half years, the fifth seal is what happens to the saints during the last three and a half years, the sixth seal happens after the tribulation period is over, and the seventh seal gives details of what happens in the great tribulation, since it includes the seven trumpet and seven vile judgments. The first part of the sixth seal is in 6, 12-13. First, the earth is taken off its axis and out of orbit with a great earthquake. 1618 says it is the greatest earthquake ever, such that whole cities fall, 1619. Then, with the tribulation period being completed, God turns off the lights. The earth has already experienced a great earthquake, 1113, and one-third of the lights being turned out on them, 812, before, as a foreshadowing of the end when they would experience the totality of similar events. The earth will be in complete darkness, probably for 45 days, 1,335 days in Daniel 12 verse 12 minus 1,290 days in Daniel 12 verse 11. The purpose of this is to give Israel time to think. Some Jews will still be alive, who have not yet worshipped the image of the beast. Therefore, they have 45 days of sitting in the dark to contemplate everything that went on during the last seven years and make the decision to repent and have faith in God to give them eternal life in His kingdom, apart from any works they have tried to do to earn eternal life. It is during these 45 days that God has promised that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, Joel 2 verse 32, from the great and the terrible day of the Lord, Joel 2 verse 31. This is represented by the five wise virgins, who trim their lamps and go in to meet the bridegroom, thanks to the midnight, in darkness, cry of the little flock, Matthew 25, 1-13. When God made the sun, moon, and stars, he said that one of their purposes was four signs, Genesis 1 verse 14. They represent the host of heaven, so that we are reminded that the earth is not all there is so that we will set our affection on things above, not on things on the earth, Colossians 3 verse 2. When God makes the sun black, the moon blood, and the stars fall from the sky, 6, 12-13, it is because a much greater sign is about to appear. This greater sign is the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, Matthew 24 verse 30. This is why the stars are said to fall as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, 613. In other words, the time for the star's usefulness as a sign has passed, now that the sign of the Son of Man will soon appear in heaven to take their place. 614, this is the second part of the sixth seal. Jesus rends the heavens like a garment, Isaiah 64 verse 1, tearing into earth's atmosphere. The way he does this is with his sword, Isaiah 34 verses 4 to 5 and Revelation 19:15, i.e., the word of God, Hebrews 4 verse 12. Before he comes, the heaven is stretched out like a curtain, Psalm 104, colon 2. So, when Jesus pokes a hole in it with his sword, it rolls up like a scroll and departs, Isaiah 34 verse 4. Since the heaven, our atmosphere, affects the things on the earth, the result on earth is that every mountain and island were moved out of their places, 614. 6, 15-17 Jesus is the true light, John 1 verse 9. He is so bright that, in the kingdom, the light of the sun is not needed, for the Lord God giveth them light, 22, 5. Now, if you have been in total darkness for 45 days, 
your eyes will need to adjust to even the least little bit of light. However, they see the greatest light ever come through the heaven. Three things to note about what happens. 1. Rich and poor, free and slave, and kings all hide together. In the tribulation period, the rich and the leaders with the Antichrist would not dare associate with slaves and common people. Man is a respecter of persons, but God is no respecter of persons. Romans 2 verse 11 See how Jesus coming immediately eliminates man's hierarchy of pride. 2. Not found among those hiding in verse 15 is believing Israel. You do not see the poor, those who did not take the mark, or the believers listed here. This is because believers have been waiting a long time for this to happen. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body, Romans 8 verse 23. Dot. It is only all unbelievers who hide. 3. Unbelievers know about God. So many people today deny God's existence and His power, claiming to be atheists. They are all liars, because God says that He has made Himself known unto all men, Romans 1 verses 19 to 20. Jesus' second coming exposes the truth that there are no atheists. No one says, what's going on, who is that coming through the heaven? or everything is fine because God does not exist. All unbelievers know exactly what is going on. Not only do they know that God exists, but they also recognize both the deity and the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. They see him as the lamb slain for their sins. They know that he is God because he sitteth on the throne, 616. They know that the great day of his wrath is come, 617 and they know they are powerless to stop him from destroying them. They know all of this, and have known it, while they were sitting in darkness. Yet, instead of calling upon the name of the Lord in order to be saved, like the believing remnant does. Joel 2 verse 32 They continue in their rebellion against God by calling upon creation to save them. They ask the mountains and rocks to hide them from God's face. So holy and bright is God that unholy man cannot look upon his face and live. When Moses saw God, God hid him in the cleft of the rock so that he would not see God's face and die. Exodus 33 verse 20. Similarly, at Jesus' second coming, unsaved men ask the mountains and rocks to keep them from being killed by looking at the Lord's face. Romans 1 verse 25 says that unbelieving man disregards his knowledge of God and worships and serves the creature more than the Creator. Therefore, at Jesus' second coming, we see man's continuation of this in proclaiming the creation to be God by calling upon creation to stop the Lord's wrath from coming against them. Also note the question of unbelievers, who shall be able to stand? 6.17 the answer is that, because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, no one can stand on his own. However, for believers, we are told that he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand, Romans 14 verse 4. Therefore, while unbelievers are mowed down by the power of God at Jesus' second coming, God makes believers stand so that they can enter God's kingdom. Finally, note how the wicked, at the end of the tribulation period, hate the Lord's appearing. Contrast this with members of the body of Christ today, who love His appearing, 2 Timothy 4 verse 8. This contrast is understood when we see who stands and who does not stand at Christ's coming. Chapter 7 Seven before the great tribulation begins, 144,000 Jews from the believing remnant of Israel are sealed. They, along with the rest of the little flock, preach the gospel of the kingdom to the lost sheep of the house of Israel during the Great Tribulation, verses 1 to 8. The result is that an innumerable number of Jews are saved, v. 9. This is how all Israel is saved, Romans 11 verse 26, and will dwell in God's kingdom on earth forever with all of the pain from the curse of sin being eradicated, verses 15 to 17. 
7,1-3, it may seem like Satan is in control of the earth during the tribulation period. Granted, God does give him a crown and allows him to go forth conquering and to conquer, 6,2, but God is still in control. God's control is seen in the fact that he commands the four angels, again, four is the number of creations in the Bible, in charge of hurting the earth and the sea, not to hurt the earth until God's servants are sealed. This sealing event seems to take place midway through the tribulation period, as 12.14 says that saved Israel is nourished by God for three and a half years from the face of the serpent, which would coincide with the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. I believe that this nourishment coincides with the sealing, here, in chapter 7. The note in 7, colon 2 that the angel has the seal of the living God may be alluding to the midpoint in the tribulation period because it is then when the Antichrist is killed by the two witnesses, 13, colon 1, 3. Therefore, at that time, the world's Christ is dead, but the true Christ cannot be killed because he is the living God. Thus, Christ is able to seal his saints. Remember that the first three and a half years of the tribulation period are the time for Israel to make their choice to trust in God to save them through his law covenant with them, instead of trusting in the Antichrist. The believing remnant of Israel are those servants of our God sealed here, 7 colon 3. Once the Antichrist is resurrected from the dead by Satan, which happens within a matter of days, from Revelation 7, there will be a mark of the beast that those on earth will be required to have in their foreheads or in their right hands, 13, colon 16, 17. This is Satan's seal. Since Satan is the great imitator of God, it makes sense that God would have a seal for his servants in their foreheads, and then Satan would copy God right afterward. We are not told if God's seal is physical, spiritual, or both. My guess is that it is only spiritual. 12.14 says that the woman, which would be believing Israel, is given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time, from the face of the serpent. A time, and times, and half a time equals three and a half years, time equals one, times equals two, and half a time equals one half, one plus two plus one half is equal to three one half, which coincides with the Great Tribulation. As a result of this protection, 1217 says that Satan was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The popular Bible believer's view is that the 144,000 are sealed and raptured up to a place in the sky, where they are protected until the tribulation period is over. There are two main problems with this view. First, 1214 says that she flies into the wilderness. A wilderness is a physically barren place. John the Baptist preached in the wilderness of Judea, Matthew 3 verse 1, where he ate locusts and wild honey, Matthew 3 verse 4, not exactly gourmet cuisine. Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness. To be tempted of the devil, Matthew 4 verse 1, and he ate nothing at all in those forty days, Matthew 4 verse 2. Jesus being led up into the wilderness coincides with believing Israel flying there. Israel spent forty years in the wilderness, and he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live, Deuteronomy 8 verse 3. Therefore, if believing Israel is in the wilderness for three and a half years, it means that they are eating very little to nothing, and that the nourishment they are receiving during that time is not physical food, but it is the spiritual food of every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord, Deuteronomy 8 verse 3. This explains why God allows the mark of the beast to be implemented for the last half of the tribulation period, in which all believers cannot participate in the Antichrist's economic system, meaning that they cannot buy food, 1317. 
This is why they must depend upon sympathetic Gentiles to give them food, water, shelter, and clothing. Matthew 25 verses 35 to 40. Therefore, believing Israel's wilderness would be in the spiritually barren land of Israel, not in God's paradise in the sky. Second, believing Israel is commissioned by God to preach the gospel to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 10 verse 6. Because Israel will be scattered abroad among the heathen, they will not be able to go to all the cities of Israel, till the Son of Man be come, Matthew 10 23. Nevertheless, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world before the end comes, Matthew 24 verse 14. If God needs believing Israel to preach the gospel to the lost sheep of Israel and that commission is not completed at Jesus' second coming, it makes no sense that God would remove 144,000 preachers from the world to wait for the tribulation period to be over. Who would be left to preach the gospel? And, what about Jesus' warning to flee into the mountains when the image of the beast is set up in the temple? Matthew 24 verses 15 to 16. There would be no need to flee if they are going to fly to heaven. Therefore, we conclude that those sealed by God are not taken off the earth. Rather, they stay right where they are. The reason that they are sealed is because the Antichrist will soon begin worship of the image of the beast and taking the mark of the beast. Doing either causes someone to spend eternity in the lake of fire. 14, 911. Therefore, God rewards those who believe the gospel of the kingdom in the first half of the tribulation with a spiritual seal that gives them the faith they need to resist the temptation to side with the Antichrist, regardless of the consequences, in the second half of the tribulation period. As such, there are at least 144,000 believers on the earth who refuse to take the mark or worship the image of the beast, which will be a powerful testimony to the remaining lost sheep of the house of Israel, so that they also will believe the gospel of the kingdom and be saved. Now, you may wonder why 6, 9-11 says that many believers will be killed during the Great Tribulation, when the servants of God are sealed beforehand. The answer is that their souls are sealed, such that they will not take the mark or worship the image, and they will be saved at the end of the tribulation period. However, they could still be arrested and killed for not bowing down to the image of the beast. There will also be the remnant of her seed, 1217, i.e., those saved during the last half of the tribulation period, who may also be killed for not bowing down. These believers being arrested and tried is all part of God's plan for all Israel to be saved. Remember that the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world before the end comes, Matthew 24 verse 14, but they will not be able to go to all the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come, Matthew 10 verse 23. The way that the whole world hears the gospel before the believing remnant goes to all the cities of Israel is through the trials of believers being broadcast for all to hear. Mark 13 verse 9 says that they will be delivered up to councils, beaten in synagogues, and brought before kings to testify. Mark 13 verse 10 says that this is how the gospel is published among all nations. This is where the gift of tongues comes in. When that gift was given, each person heard, in his own tongue, the word spoken, Acts 2 verses 8 and 11. Therefore, when the trials of believers are televised, every word they speak will be heard by everyone in his own tongue, and, since the Holy Ghost will be speaking through the believers, Mark 13 verse 11, they will be speaking a clear, gospel message that the whole world will hear. Now, getting back to those sealed in Revelation 7. These people are represented by the Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace in Daniel 3. Because they entered the fiery trial of the great tribulation period with faith in God, those sealed by God will come out of the fire of the great tribulation period and scathed, just like with the three Hebrew boys. This is why Jesus told his disciples that the very hairs of your head are all numbered, Matthew 10 verse 30, because God will replace everything of theirs in the kingdom. 
including down to the minute detail of the hairs on their heads, Matthew 19 verse 29. 7, 4-8 Note that those sealed are all from the tribes of the children of Israel, 7, 4. Doubters will say, no one knows what tribe they are from, so how can precisely 12,000 be sealed from each tribe? The answer is that, while man may not know what tribe he is in, God knows. Since God is the one doing the sealing, this is not an issue. With each tribe of Israel listed here, how could anyone possibly believe that God will not fulfill his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to the literal nation of Israel? The popular religious argument of us being spiritual Israel cannot possibly fly in light of tribal names being given here. After all, it is one thing to say we are spiritual Israel. It is quite another to say, you are spiritual Gad, while I am spiritual Manassas. How would such a thing be determined? Now, Jacob had twelve sons, and Joseph, one of the twelve, received a double blessing, making thirteen tribes. However, because twelve is governmental perfection and thirteen is the number of rebellions, there are always only twelve tribes listed with one being excluded. Joseph and his son, Manassas, are listed here, representing Joseph's double blessing. The tribe of Dan is excluded. The reason is probably because the tribe of Dan led Israel into idolatry, 1 Kings 12 verses 28 to 30. Therefore, the tribe of Dan has been defiled, making them unworthy to be sealed, 14 colon 4. However, Dan will be in the kingdom. Dan shall judge his people, A.S. one of the tribes of Israel. Genesis 49 verse 16. In other words, Dan judges, as if they are listed here. Perhaps they rule over Judah's portion of the earth, since Jesus, of the tribe of Judah, will be reigning in Jerusalem. 7, 9, we now jump past the great tribulation period to God's throne room in Jesus' kingdom on earth. The point is, to show that the result of the labor of the believing remnant during the Great Tribulation is that an innumerable multitude of Jews make it into God's eternal kingdom on earth. 5 9 says that saved Israel came out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Therefore, the nations, kindreds, people, and tongues mentioned in 7 9 represent saved Israel rather than having Gentiles here as well. This is evident from them being saved out of great tribulation and serving before God I in his temple, 7, 14-15. Israel is scattered among the nations in the tribulation period due to their disobedience of the law covenant, as promised in Leviticus 26 verse 33. Thus, Jews come into God's eternal kingdom on earth from all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, 7, 9. We should mention that Gentiles will be saved for blessing Israel, as Matthew 25 verses 31 to 46 mentions. However, the focus of the book of Revelation and the tribulation period is to get Israel saved so that they may go out to the Gentiles during the millennial reign as a kingdom of priests. Thus, the time of Jewish salvation in Israel's program is in the tribulation period, while the time of Gentile salvation in Israel's program is in the millennial reign. In Revelation 4, John saw the holiness of God's throne and the glory which the Lord receives forever. This is the good news that is the result of Revelation 5-6, to the opening up of the book with seven seals and the resulting tribulation period. Similarly, in Revelation 7, John sees the end from the beginning, which is how God declares things. Isaiah 46 verse 10, because he is the beginning and the ending, 1 colon 8. This scene in heaven is the result of the opening up of the seventh seal in Revelation 8 and the resulting events of the great tribulation period. Therefore, John gets the good news before he gets the bad news so that he may see the necessity of all of the events of the tribulation period. Now, we know that the multitude of Jews before the throne and the Lamb, here in 7, 9, are righteous, because they are wearing white robes. 
19,8 says that these white robes are the righteousness of saints. Therefore, we see, here, the fulfillment of Romans 11 verse 26, that all Israel shall be saved. The palms in their hands, 7, 9, are significant because, at Jesus' second coming, he will fulfill the fall feasts given to Israel under the law covenant. The tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. Leviticus 23 verse 27 The ultimate fulfillment of the Day of Atonement is at Jesus' second coming when he blots out their sins, Acts 3 verses 19 to 20. The fact that they already have white robes in 7, 9 shows this event has already taken place when John sees them in the future. Then, five days later, on the fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord, Leviticus 23 verse 34. This is when Israel remembers how they dwelt in tents in the wilderness, and thanks God for bringing them into the promised land. The ultimate fulfillment of this is that, after their sins are forgiven at Jesus' second coming, Israel remembers how they dwelt in the tents of their mortal flesh in the wilderness of the earth with Satan being God of the world. 2 Corinthians 4, colon 4, and thanks God for their new bodies and for bringing them into the promised land of God's eternal kingdom on earth. Leviticus 23 verse 40 says that part of that Feast of Tabernacles is that they take bunches of palm trees and rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. The palms in their hands in 7, colon 9, then, show that John is Seeing the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles after Israel receives atonement for their sin at Jesus' second coming. 7.10 They rejoice before the Lord by proclaiming salvation to our God. 7.10 In other words, they were part of Satan's kingdom, but now, thanks to God's atonement of them, they are saved to be joined to their God forever. Therefore, they are not saying that God is saved but they are saying that they are the saved and they belong to God. Also note the further revelation here that their God is both fully God and fully man. In Leviticus 23.40 in the Feast of Tabernacles, they rejoiced before the Lord their God. Now, in the full fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles, they know that their Messiah is also their God. Therefore, they rejoice before God, which speaks of Jesus' deity, and before the Lamb, which speaks of his humanity. 7-11 people, who were saved through the tribulation period, are standing before the throne, 7, 9. The angels, elders, and beasts stand about the throne, 7-11. This indicates that the angels, elders, and beasts, along with God, all have their attention on what is before the throne, the believing remnant of Israel. Therefore, their proclamation, in 7.12, of blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might unto God is in relation to God's salvation of Israel, through the tribulation. 7.12, as we saw in 5.12, we see the angels proclaim seven things about God, with seven being the number of spiritual perfections. The list in 5.12 and the list in 7.12 are a little different from each other because 5.12 relates to God as the Lamb, thus, it relates to His humanity. As the Lamb, He receives riches for winning the victory, and He receives strength to rule over all. Since God already has riches and strength, these are replaced in 7.12 by thanksgiving and might. As God, He receives thanksgiving from redeemed man. He also receives might which is the authority that Satan has now in heaven and earth. Satan loses this authority as a result of God's redemption of man through the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, the thanksgiving and might parts relate specifically to God's victory over Satan in redeeming the believing remnant of Israel standing before the Lord here. 7, 13-14 in 7, 3-8 we saw the 144,000 sealed Jews before the Great Tribulation period began, 7, 3-8. They, along with the rest of the little flock of Israel, preached the gospel of the kingdom to the cities of Israel, such that an innumerable crowd of Jews, 7, 9, 
come out of great tribulation, 714, saved. Now, when the tribulation period starts, very few believers are on the earth since all believers from the mystery dispensation were raptured up just prior to this. Therefore, God sends his two witnesses to Israel to preach to them during the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, 11, 1-7. The result of these two preachers is that 144,000 are saved. It is easy to see, then, how 144,000 Jews and the rest of the little flock of Israel, preaching for three and a half years, would result in an innumerable group of Jews being saved, 7, 9. This innumerable group are the ones who had to learn faith in God the hard way. Only by going through great tribulation did they make it into the kingdom. Some of these were killed by the Antichrist and apostate Israel for the word of God and for the testimony which they held, 6, 9. Going through tribulation in order to be saved shows how man will usually only humble himself before God when he is tried. After all, God wanted to give Israel the kingdom under Moses, but they would not believe because they thought of themselves as something special. Israel's history is filled with unbelief. But when they lose everything in the tribulation period, they finally believe. This is also why the most economically prosperous countries in the world follow vain philosophies and are deceived, while the poorer countries are more likely to believe the gospel and be saved. Their washing their robes and making them white in the blood of the Lamb, 714, is a fulfillment of Isaiah 1 verse 18. Their own righteousnesses were as filthy rags, Isaiah 64, colon 6. Their sins had made their garments as scarlet, Isaiah 1 verse 18. However, by having faith in God's promises to Israel under the law covenant, they washed their scarlet garments in the blood of the Lamb, 7 14, making them as white as snow, Isaiah 1 verse 18, so that they now have God's righteousness and will live in God's kingdom on earth forever. 7 15 This verse starts with therefore. Because Israel believed God's promises to them, their sins are washed in the blood of the Lamb, making them righteous. Therefore, because they are righteous, they are before the throne of God, and serve Him day and night in His temple, 715. This quotation tells us why there are no Gentiles in this group of saved people standing before the throne. God promised Israel that they would be His kingdom of priests, Exodus 19 verse 6. As priests of the Lord, Israel shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, Isaiah 61 verse 6. Now, a priest is a mediator between God and man, as seen by the Lord Jesus Christ's example in Hebrews 9 verses 14 to 15. Therefore, Israel's job in God's kingdom on earth is to come to God on behalf of the Gentiles. That is how they serve God day and night in his temple, 715. God then dwells among saved Israel, since saved Israel is his people. Note that the verse says that he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. This is very similar to Jesus' statement to conclude the book of Matthew, where he said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, Matthew 28 verse 20. That is because both passages refer to Israel going to the Gentiles as a kingdom of priests for God in the millennial reign. This tells us that what Jesus meant in Matthew 28 verse 20 was that his word would go with believing Israel so that the Gentiles may be saved. Thus, Jesus' statement emphasizes the importance of scripture as opposed to churchianity's interpretation that you can feel his presence at all times. 7, 16-17 These, coming out of great tribulation, did not take the mark of the beast, 14, 9-11, and so they could not buy food, 13, 17. Although they did have some help from Gentiles and fellow Jews, Matthew 25 verses 35 to 40, they went hungry and thirsty often. Therefore, the promise, here, that they will hunger and thirst no more. Spiritually speaking, they also hungered and thirsted after righteousness, 
and God fulfills his promise to them of filling them with the spiritual food of the things of God, Matthew 5 verse 6. The sun lighting on them and the heat of the sun on them is the hard part of 716 to understand. The fact that it does not happen any more in God's kingdom must mean that it was part of the curse of sin. We can connect this with the last part of 717, where the elder says that God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, which tells us that the sun's light and the heat must have caused them pain. Based on Psalm 121 verses 5 to 6, the Lord is thy shade. Upon thy right hand, and Isaiah 49 verses 9 to 12, neither shall the heat nor sun smite them. It appears that the sunlight or heat has to do with Satan's people persecuting God's believing remnant in Israel. It also may be related to the curse of sin, as sunburn, heat stroke, and hypothermia are ailments coming from the sun, which will be done away with in God's kingdom, as Israel has no need for the light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light. 22, 5. Therefore, 716 is saying that all hunger, thirst, and persecution that the believing remnant of Israel suffered during the Great Tribulation are over for them in God's eternal kingdom on earth. In that kingdom, the Lamb is in the midst of the throne, 717. He is also God. Being both the Lamb and God makes him the Good Shepherd, John 10 verse 14. With the Lord being their shepherd, they shall not want for anything. He gives them rest, he feeds them with his word, and the Holy Ghost provides the living fountains of waters, Psalm 23. Funny how the lamb feeds them, when it is usually the sheep who get fed, not the other way around. The tears they cried in the great tribulation are no more. Therefore, the believing remnant can look to these two verses, 7, 16-17, as encouragement to endure unto the end of the tribulation period. Chapter 8 8. The seventh seal is opened, V1, which means that the seven trumpet judgments can begin. The prayers of the saints have been heard, verses 3-5 which means that God brings judgment against man, but grace to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The first four trumpet judgments destroy one-third of the earth, verses 6 to 12, as a warning that man is about to be destroyed, v. 13, if he does not believe the gospel. 8, 1-2, the seventh seal, contains seven trumpet judgments and the seventh trumpet judgment contains seven vile judgments, 16, colon 1. Seven is the number of spiritual perfections, and three is the number of divine completeness. Since the tribulation period is filled with seven by three, seals, trumpets, and vials, tribulations, it shows that it takes three sevens for God's complete spiritual perfection to work itself into Israel. The seven trumpet judgments and the seven vile judgments are all contained within the seventh seal judgment, and the seventh seal judgment represents all of the great tribulations that take place during the last three and a half years or last half of the tribulation period. It is great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be, Matthew 24 verse 21. Therefore, there is silence in heaven about the space of half an hour, 8 colon 1, for the severity of what is about to take place. Note that it is the seven angels which stood before God, who are given the seven trumpet judgments, 8 colon 2. We saw, in Revelation 2 to 3, how these angels were sent with message to the seven churches in Asia. They are ministering spirits sent to help the sheep of the house of Israel scattered abroad in Asia, to be saved at the end of the tribulation period. Therefore, these seven trumpet judgments will help the churches, as well, as they will teach Israel not to trust in the flesh and the material rewards that the Antichrist and apostate Israel offer them, and trust in the things of the Spirit that God offers them instead. 8, 3-5, the prayers of all saints, 8, 3, would be prayers for two things. 1. Prayers for God to judge, 6.10, the unsaved who persecute the saved, and 2. Prayers for all of the lost sheep of Israel to be saved. 
The smoke of the incense and the prayers of the saints ascend up to God, 8, 4. These prayers are a sweet smell to God, such that God responds with fire that is cast into the earth, 8, 5. This is the refiner's fire of God, Malachi 3, verse 2, by which he will purify Israel to make them pleasant unto the Lord, Malachi 3 verses 3 to 4, and the fire will also judge the unbelievers, Malachi 3 verse 5. As mentioned in the notes on 4, colon 5, the voices represent God's word. Therefore, God does not just punish the earth, but he also gives the revelation of his word by the Holy Ghost to the believing remnant so that they will continue to have faith in God unto the end of the tribulation period. The thunderings represent God's judgment of man. The lightnings represent the fall of Satan and his forces to the earth. 12 colon 7 dash 9 says that Satan and his forces are cast out of heaven unto the earth, midway through the tribulation period. In Luke 10 verse 18, Jesus equates Satan's fall to lightning falling from the sky. Of course, in addition to the written word of God being the voices, here, there are also audible voices from angels in heaven, such as the declarations in 12 to 10-12 and 813. When God spoke to Israel from Mount Sinai, they heard the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded, and if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Hebrews 12, 19-21 With regard to God speaking in the tribulation period, Hebrews 12 verses 25-26 says, See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape, if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven, Hebrews 12 verses 25 to 26. Therefore, the voices coming from God's throne, in themselves, will be enough to scare the BGVs out of many Jews, such that they believe the gospel of the kingdom right then and there. Finally, the earthquake in 8, 5 is the groaning and traveling in pain, Romans 8 verse 22, of the earth, as it is forced to accept the devil and all of his evil forces for the last half of the tribulation period, as they have been cast out of heaven by Michael and his angels, 12, 7-9. 8, 7-12, the first four trumpets pretty much destroy one-third of the heaven and the earth, as a precursor to the fifth and sixth trumpets, in which one-third of the men on the earth are killed. Who are among the one-third killed by the sixth trumpet is determined by man's response to what happens in the preceding trumpet judgments. The first four trumpet judgments are progressively severe. In the first trumpet judgment, one-third of the trees and all green grass are burned up. This reduces the food supply, as man cannot get fruit off of the trees and animals cannot be fed by the grass, and so the world's supply of meat and fruit goes down dramatically. So now, the Antichrist, who is doling out plenty of food under the third seal, 6, 6, does not have the food that he once did. This should be a sign to man that the Antichrist is not God for he cannot control the food supply. God could have easily destroyed the trees and grass by fire alone, but he mixes blood in there to show it is the judgment of God upon man. It is now up to man to drink of the wine which, wisdom has, mingled, Proverbs 9 verse 5, seeing that as the judgment of God and repenting, having faith in the gospel, so that they may enter God's eternal kingdom on earth. In the second trumpet judgment, 8, 8, the water supply of the earth is affected by one-third of the sea becoming blood. A mountain represents religion, and the sea represents Satan's realm. Again, God could easily have just turned one-third of the sea into blood. But, by throwing a mountain into the sea, 
resulting in the blood, the type is set for those on earth with the ears to hear that the great mountain of the Jewish religion will soon fall, and the result will be eternal damnation in the lake of fire for all those in Israel who believe man's religion over God's words to Israel under his law covenant with them. An example of this is seen in Mark 11 verse 23, where Jesus tells Israel to have the faith to cast the mountain of religion into the sea. Since they do not yet have this faith, God does it for them with the second trumpet judgment to show Israel that they will need to abandon apostate Israel's religious system and believe God's law covenant with them if they are going to enter God's eternal kingdom on earth. 8 colon 9 mentions that one third of the sea creatures died, which shows that, all those, trusting in the Babylonian religious system, will die right along with it and have their part in the lake of fire. In 9 colon 1, a star falls from heaven, and he was given the key of the bottomless pit. This shows that stars often represent angels in the Bible. Now, in 8 colon 10 11, the third trumpet judgment is a great star, called Wormwood, that fell from the sky. In Deuteronomy 29 verse 18, bearing. Wormwood is equated with Israel turning away from the Lord to serve other gods, which is exactly what they do under the Antichrist. The waters. 8 11, as opposed to the sea, refer to life in God, as we see Jesus promising believers a well of water, John 4 verse 14, and we see a pure river of water of life, proceeding out of God's throne in his kingdom on earth, Revelation 22 verse 1. Therefore, while one-third of the waters on the earth do actually become bitter, cutting off the water supply for the inhabitants of the earth, this event represents a greater spiritual truth. That truth is that people will look for eternal life in the great tribulation period, but God's law covenant with Israel will be corrupted, or be made bitter, by the Antichrist and apostate Israel, such that, all that drink of their religion, rather than of the pure words of life found in God's law covenant, will spiritually die, just like all men drinking of the bitter waters touched by wormwood will physically die. Therefore, one-third of the waters becoming bitter is probably telling us that one-third of the world's inhabitants bowed down to the image of the beast initially. This is how they die spiritually. Note also that wormwood will be burning as it were a lamp, 810. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Thus, Wormwood's burning a as it were a lamp shows how the Antichrist will be promoting a counterfeit word of God, which is seen today in the many different Bible versions and differing Bible teachings available. We also see the bitterness of the Christian religion today, as they make people sick on the guilt and burdens of the law that they put on people, due to a failure to rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verses 15-18. In 8.12, the fourth trumpet judgment is that one-third of all of the light in heaven goes away. In 12.1 and Genesis 37 verse 9.10, the nation of Israel is pictured as the sun, moon, and stars. Therefore, when one-third of the sun, moon, and stars are smitten and are darkened by the fourth trumpet judgment, this pictures how one-third of Israel will become apostate by taking the mark and worshipping the image of the beast during the Great Tribulation period. Because of their unbelief at this time, they are not part of the Israel of God, Galatians 6 verse 16, which explains how all Israel shall be saved, Romans 11 verse 26, even though one-third of them end up in the lake of fire. Note also that one-third of the day and one of three of the night do not shine either. So, if day and night typically last 12 hours each, after this judgment, there will be only eight hours per day when the sun shines and only eight hours per day when the moon and stars shine, and they will only shine at 2-3 power. Then, there will be eight hours of utter darkness each day, no sun, moon, or stars shining. It is important to note this utter darkness for each day. If it were only the sun not shining for as long as before, scientists would probably come up with some explanation to put people at ease, I am sure they will do this anyway. 
However, if stars also stop shining part of the time, people will know that something major is going on, since stars never stop shining. I would say that this represents how one-third of the Gentiles will also seal their doom in the lake of fire by taking the mark and worshipping the image of the beast. As such, God has used his judgments in heaven and earth to warn men not to follow the Antichrist and apostate Israel. Those with the ears to hear, chapter 2 to 3, will understand the meanings of these judgments. 813 In case man is too blind to see God's warnings by the first four trumpet judgments, God sends an angel to warn man and tell them that the worst is yet to come. There are three woes here to represent each of the three remaining trumpet judgments. Each of these judgments are called woes, while the first four trumpets were not, because the last three are direct attacks on mankind. Note how God is gracious in his judgments of man. God is unwilling that any should perish, 2 Peter 3 verse 9. Therefore, he brings judgments in the tribulation period that gradually get worse, so that man will see his guilt before God and his need to have faith in what God has told him so that he may have eternal life with God, instead of perishing in the lake of fire. Thus, we see God warning mankind, via an angel, proclaiming more woes upon the earth that are to come. We should also note that the angel calls mankind inhabitants of the earth, 813. They do not own the earth due to their unbelief. It is the faithful who will inherit the earth, Matthew 5 verse 5. Therefore, these unbelievers are mere inhabitants. Chapter 9 9 This chapter contains the fifth and sixth trumpet judgments. In the fifth trumpet judgment, verses 1 to 11, mankind is tormented for five months to give them a taste of what eternity in the lake of fire will be like. In the sixth trumpet judgment, verses 13 to 19, one third of the world's population is destroyed to show them their end result of following the Antichrist. In spite of these severe judgments, man continues in his evil ways because he is spiritually dead, verses 20 to 21. 9 colon 1 as mentioned before, the star falling from heaven is an angel, which is why the star is referred to as him. See 12 colon 4, where the angels are referred to as stars. After the tribulation period is over, the angel, with the key to the bottomless pit, binds Satan and puts him in the pit for 1,000 years, 20 colon 1 2. However, that is still future. At the time of Revelation 9, an angel releases forces from the bottomless pit upon the earth. In fact, the fifth and sixth trumpet judgments are so bad that they come from satanic forces that have been locked up for thousands of years, waiting for this specific time of severe judgment upon the earth. 9.2 When the bottomless pit is opened, the smoke, coming out of it, is so bad that it darkens the sun, and it even darkens the air. When the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, it was so great that Moses could not enter the tabernacle, Exodus 40 verse 34. When the devil's essence comes on the earth, it is a darkening presence that is a filthy, nasty smoke as the smoke of a great furnace, 9 colon 2. This shows the contrast between God and the devil. 9 colon 3 dash 18 when locusts were released upon Egypt, they ate everything green on the earth, Exodus 10 verses 14 to 15. When locusts are released for the fifth trumpet judgment, they torment man. Then, in the sixth trumpet judgment, horses and horsemen come and kill one-third of man. These two judgments serve as a type of what is described in Joel 2 verse 111, when, at Jesus' second coming, the believing remnant go forth, under the Lord Jesus Christ's lead, and destroy the Antichrist's forces so that Israel may inhabit the land once again. When they do this, they are described as having the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run, Joel 2 verse 4. Thus, for those who survive the fifth and sixth trumpet judgments, they still have a chance to repent and believe the gospel, so that they will not be destroyed at Jesus' second coming. 9 colon 3 dash 4 in the first four trumpet judgments, 
found in chapter 8, God has already pretty much destroyed one-third of the things in the earth. Therefore, the job of these locusts is not the same as it was in Exodus 10. They have the power of scorpions, which means they are on the earth to hurt people. This is why they are told not to go after what they normally go after, i.e., the green stuff on the earth. Instead, they are to hurt people. They have the power to hurt any man, except for the 144,000 sealed in God, 9, colon 4. Therefore, even Jews, who heed the warnings of the first four trumpet judgments by repenting and believing the gospel of the kingdom, will be tormented by these locusts. This tells us that the unsealed believing remnant will have a difficult time during these three and a half years, to say the least. Thus, we see the importance for Israel to believe the gospel before the great tribulation starts, so that they can be sealed by God and avoid such torment that people will wish they could die to get out of the torment. 9, colon 6. This sealing, then, should remind us of Israel during the plagues of Egypt. All of Egypt was hurt by the plagues, except for Israel. Example, Exodus 9 verse 26. So, too, all those 144,000 who are in the Israel of God and are thus sealed to begin the Great Tribulation will be the only ones on earth not touched by the events of the Great Tribulation. As such, they will be a sign to the rest of Israel that they also need to repent and believe the gospel if they are to be saved from God's wrath to come. 9.5-6 For five months, the earth will be filled with locusts that torment people with the sting of a scorpion. People will be so tormented that they will want to die, but death shall flee from them. 9.6 This means that all attempted suicides will fail. Thus, this gives man a taste of what the lake of fire will be like where man will be tormented forever, probably by these very same locusts, and there will be no way for them to stop their torment by dying. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. 1411. The message to mankind will be that, if they do not want to suffer like this permanently, they had better place their faith in what God has told them. The rich man asked Abraham to tell his family about how awful hell fire is, Luke 16 verses 27 to 28. Well, for five months, God gives the world just a small taste of what the lake of fire will be like so that they may believe the gospel to them and be saved. Since this is just a taste of hell and men still seek death, we can only imagine the sheer torment of eternity in the lake of fire. Thus, these five months of torment show God's tough love for the world, that he would inflict such pain upon them for five months, so that they do not have to suffer much worse pain for all eternity. For those Jews who do believe during this time, Jesus tells the story in Matthew 7 verses 9 to 11 about how, if a son asks his father for a fish, his father will not give him a serpent. So, too, their Heavenly Father will give good things to those who ask Him. Therefore, we see that those, having faith in the gospel during this time, will be given the Word of God to help them through the worst time of torture the world will ever see. As a side note, people today are not used to having to deal with pain. Whenever they have pain, they take some pill to keep them from feeling it. There is no pill to remedy locusts constantly stinging you. Therefore, because man's pain tolerance is very low due to pain medications, the pain they experience during these five months will be more severe than John's original audience could even imagine. 9 colon 7 dash 10 These locusts look like lean, mean, fighting machines. They look like battle-trained horses. The gold-like crowns on their heads indicate that they are the rulers over the world for these five months. Crowns were given to them, just like with Satan in 6, 2. They certainly could not have earned the crowns, since they were imprisoned in the bottomless pit, 9, 1-3. Dot. 
Having faces of man probably serves to freak out the men they torture. Having the hair of women would do the same thing. Thus, men see, in the locusts' faces, something that looks like them. Since people believe in evolution, I wonder if this is God's way of giving them a taste of their own medicine. In other words, will men see this as a creature that has evolved past man, since men are powerless to stop the locusts from torturing them? The teeth of lions indicates their fierceness. It shows man that these locusts could tear them to shreds at any time, but they will not, because that would be letting man off too easily. The breastplates of iron show that man is powerless to try to kill, or even injure, them. Their wings make them sound like war machines. So, when they are on the move, men know that their attack is near, which makes the anticipation of their arrival an added torture to men. Finally, the worst part of all of this is their scorpion-like tails, because they use their tails to torture men for five months. Now, it is obvious, by looking at these locusts, that they can do a lot more damage by using the rest of their bodies. I think this is to show men that this is just a taste of the torment they will experience in the lake of fire, should they not place their trust in what God has told them. Now, you may wonder if these creatures are human, devils, or something else. We know, from the text, that they are locusts. This makes them insects that were created for the very purpose of tormenting men, probably primarily in the lake of fire, for all eternity. That is when they will be able to use all of their bodies, not just their tails, to torture man, since there will be no way for them to kill man in hell. Thus, torture can be at its maximum in hell. By the way, some Christians think these locusts are really helicopters, but that makes absolutely no sense. 9-11, this angel is probably a devil on Satan's side. He is probably mentioned here to show that Satan has devils, whose sole jobs are to make sure people are adequately tortured for all eternity. Judging by what happens here, it looks like they are up to the challenge. Proverbs 30 verse 27 says that the locusts do not have a king over them. Therefore, the fact that these locusts do have a king over them shows us that they are not ordinary locusts. The words Abaddon and Apollyon mean destroyer. Along with Gabriel and Michael, these are the only angels named in the Bible. In my opinion, the Grim Reaper should be called either Abaddon or Apollyon. Nine twelve people already want to die because the first woe, fifth trumpet judgment, is so bad. Yet, there are two more woes to come, and the last woe contains the seven vile judgments of Revelation 16. Therefore, the tribulations of the Great Tribulation period are just getting started at this point, which shows just how bad things will really get. 9.13-14 This time, instead of releasing locusts, this angel releases four angels to bring judgment. The fact that these angels were bound shows that they are fallen angels. They are so bad that God does not even let them do Satan's work because they probably would not obey. Their sole job is to execute this sixth trumpet judgment. The voice comes from the golden altar, which is before God, 913. This is the altar mentioned in 8, 3, upon which the prayers of the saints were offered. So, the prayers of the saints, asking God how long it will be before God avenges their blood, 610, is answered, in part, by the sixth trumpet judgment in which those who have sided with the Antichrist so far by bowing down to his image or by taking his mark early on, are killed. Therefore, the commandment to loose the four angels, 914, probably comes from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. 915 Note that these angels were prepared for this task of slaying one-third of the world's population. Now, we already saw in 6, 8 that one quarter of the world has already been killed. This means that, after the one-third are killed with the sixth trumpet judgment, 
a total of 50% of the world's population is killed just with these two executed judgments. An example with numbers will make this clear. Let's say there are 8 billion people in the world at the beginning of the tribulation period. One quarter of the world is killed in 6, colon 8, leaving 6 billion people. One third of these are killed in the sixth trumpet judgment, leaving 4 billion people. 4 billion is half of 8 billion. As can be seen, this is a monumental task to complete. That is why these four angels had to be prepared just for this specific hour, day, month, and year, in which they would oversee the killing of 2 billion people. The idea is that, by killing all those, who have already bowed down to the image or taken the mark, the rest of the unbelievers can see that, if they follow suit, God will also kill them. This is not some idle threat. Since God has the power to kill two billion people at once, no one, not even the Antichrist, can stop God from killing the rest of the world. At the beginning of the Great Tribulation period, the world worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? 13, colon 4. Now, they have their answer. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Exodus 15, verse 3. 9, 16. These are 200 hundred million horsemen, under the leadership of these four angels, who killed a two billion or so people. We are not told who the 200 hundred million men riding these horses are, or even if they are men. Since they are part of the army under the four angels, they are probably devils, just like the four angels are. 9.17-19 Note that the ones sitting on the horses are just along for the ride. It is the horses themselves that kill one-third of the world's population. They kill them with the fire, brimstone, and smoke coming out of their mouths, signaling that there is more torment of fire, brimstone, and smoke to come in the lake of fire. Now, we saw, in the picture of one-third of the waters becoming bitter in the third trumpet judgment in 811, that one-third of the world bowed down to the image of the beast. 14,9-11 says that those bowing down to the image, or taking the mark of the beast, will experience fire, brimstone, and smoke forever. Since their eternal destiny is sealed when they bow down, it makes sense that the one-third of the world, who initially bow to the image, are the ones killed here, as a sign to the rest of the world, that they will also go into the lake of fire, for all eternity, if they bow down. These horses also use their lion-like heads, and their serpent-like tails, to hurt men. Thus, they hurt men, and then they kill them. God's justice makes the punishment fit the crime, as God says, and if any mischief follows, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe, Exodus 21 verses 23 to 25. Since these people followed that old serpent, called the devil, and Satan, 12, 9, it makes sense that they would be hurt by serpent-like tails. Thus, God is always just, even with dirty, rotten sinners. Also, note that these verses emphasize that the men are killed by fire, probably to make it clear that God remembered his covenant with Noah and did not kill them by water, Genesis 9 verse 11. 9, 20-21, 20 so, half of the world's population has already been killed by this point. Those remaining have seen this. They have seen that those bowing down to the image of the beast were killed, while the believing remnant of 144,000 have been spared all six of the trumpet judgments. They have heard voices from heaven, warning them of what was happening, yet they repented not, 920. How much plainer can God make it that man is sinful and in need of a savior? If they do not believe the gospel, they will burn in hell. The Antichrist has probably explained all of this away by saying that the devil, who we know is really the Lord God, has done this, and the only way to be saved is to follow the Antichrist, who will lead them to God, who we know is really Satan. Isaiah 5 verses 20-21 Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil, 
that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes, and prudent in their own sight. The remaining. Unbelievers should not be fooled by the Antichrist. They should see that the Antichrist and his forces are on the devil's side because they have already seen that God is more powerful than the devil is. After all, God just wiped out one-third of the world's population, and the ones he wiped out are the ones who bowed down to the image. The Antichrist, though, does not have this power. Of those who have not bowed down, the Antichrist is only able to kill those he can catch. God probably divinely protects a good portion of the little flock so that they can reach the lost sheep of Israel with the gospel, much like God protected David when Saul was trying to kill them, since this is a type of the Great Tribulation period. Therefore, unbelievers can look at what the Antichrist says, examine the evidence of 50% of the world's population having been killed, and determine that the force behind believing Israel is more powerful than the force behind the Antichrist. Therefore, the God, who believing Israel worships, must be the true God since he is the more powerful of the two. This is simple logic. However, the unbelievers are so far gone into apostasy, at this point, that God has given them over to a reprobate mind, Romans 1 verse 28, such that they continue in their evil deeds. This means that, in spite of the evidence before them, many will bow down to the image and take the mark of the beast and have their place in the lake of fire for all eternity, as a result. Jesus prophesied of this by saying, As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be, Matthew 24 verse 37. In the days of Noah, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, Genesis 6 verse 5. God warned them, through Enoch and Noah, and no one outside of. Noah's family believed. Therefore, during the great tribulation period, man is not thinking of who is greater, God or the devil. Man does what he has always done, which is trying to figure out how he can do the evil that he has purposed in his heart to do and get away with it. Man's best chance of this appears to be following the Antichrist. Therefore, he bows down to the image of the beast. The evil of these men is divided into two categories, one, idol worship, v20, and two, self-worship through their sins, verse 21. The idol worship involves the worshipping of devils. People will say that idol worship does not happen today, but it does. We see it in the Catholic Church, in other denominations within Christendom, and in other religions. Idol worship is really following anything that man has made. Much of the idol worship today in the United States is of the Hollywood stars. Note that 920 calls it the works of their hands. This makes man the creator, and, in turn, makes him a god. They have changed the glory of the uncorruptible god into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things, Romans 1 23, serving the creature more than the creator, Romans 1 verse 25. Psalm 115 verse 8 says, They that make idols are like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. Therefore, even after half of the world's population has been killed, spiritually speaking, the remaining unbelievers are just as dead as the idols that they make. Being spiritually dead, then, they use their time solely to fulfill the lusts of the flesh, which is what 921 says. More important than the physical acts of 921 are the spiritual acts. They spiritually murder by getting others to bow down to the image. They spiritually practice sorcery by getting people to fall into the spell of the Babylonian religion. They spiritually commit fornication by serving other gods, such as the God of forces, Daniel 11 verse 38, rather than serving the true God. They spiritually steal by trying to take the eternal rewards in God's kingdom away from the little flock by getting the little flock to stop serving God and follow the Babylonian religion instead.